In the long history of motorcycle racing, one man stands above all the others in terms of public recognition and acclaim. And that man is Barry Sheen. Because none of the others have combined, as he does, sheer charisma, riding ability, mechanical acumen, and business ability too. But don't take my word for it. We're now going to join Barry to see six of the best, his choice of his top motorcycle races. Come and meet the great man. We've known each other a, a long time now, and you've ridden some fantastic races in your life. It's been my privilege to watch a lot of them. We're going to talk about six of them. Which would you say were the most important, starting with Holland? Uh, well, 75 in Essen was a really important race to me because it was my first win on the 500 Grand Prix bike. And uh, it was something that I knew I could do. Yeah obviously always wanting to to win a 500 grand prix and it was the first time that i won so it was obviously something that meant a lot to me now there were three other countries as well there was italy and south africa and uh, britain why have you chosen them the countries well italy i used to love italy and the italian people and i used to get on very well with them out there yeah. and imola was uh before they buggered it up putting all those silly chicanes in um, it was my favourite circuit in Italy, and I never, ever seemed to have any luck there. Um, and I remember saying to Dad and Steph and Mum the night before the race, you see something will go wrong. Any money you like, the bloody thing won't start, or it'll break a chain or blow its brains out. And it was just such a relief to win the Italian Grand Prix. And South Africa, France, and uh, Britain? Um, South Africa in 84. It was probably the best race of my career because I was on a totally substandard bike, power-wise, and it was a frame of my own sort of geometry and that, and it was just such a satisfying race. But Britain, 79 for me, was the best I, of the lot. I know you <laughs> like that one. Uh, yeah, it was a great race. You know, it was such a good race because it was really enjoyable to ride in. OK, I didn't win it, but... Uh, it was such a good race for, I'm sure it did more for motorcycling in that race than any sort of advertising campaign could ever do. Because people, for years and years after, still indeed now, you know, they say, Phil oh, about oh you yeah. remember that yeah. race, you That's and right. uh, That's Kenny right. Rogers. That's right. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, a picture is worth a thousand words. Let's go and look at them. Oh, right, okay. Barry, six of the best, and your number one is the 1975 Dutch TT at Assen, as they always are. 200,000 orange boom drinking <laughs> Dutchmen are there to watch you. Uh, and you won't need reminding, but let me just remind you that less than three months ago, you'd had a quite appalling accident at Daytona. You'd broken your left thigh, you'd broken your wrist, your forearm, your collarbone, you'd fractured your spine, you'd had six ribs broken, you had your kidneys damaged, but you're there. Now, why have you chosen this race as number one? Well, because it was, uh, it's the 500cc Suzuki started in 1974. And it was, it, I knew from the first time I rode it, it had massive potential. Um, the whole year in 1974, it kept breaking gearboxes and seizing up and throwing me out there. I crashed about 10 times um, with the thing just breaking to pieces. And then at the beginning of 75, I was in Japan for five weeks to develop the thing. And I said, look, I'll stay there until it's right. 
when I left Japan, as far as I was concerned, it was right. Um, then after the Daytona crash, I missed the French Grand Prix, and then the bloody thing broke down in another race, and it broke down in all stupid things that happened, the, broom, the breakdowns. And um, Assen was the beginning of it all, you know. The, it was when everything finally mm -hmm. came together, and the, uh, the uh, Japanese lot from Suzuki were getting to the stage where they were thinking, well, is it ever going to happen, sort of business. And what I, was your attitude to the race? As far what do you mean, in, as far as my injuries from... Yeah, exactly. mm, well, I'd got over them. You know, that was it. I had a bloody great big 14-inch steel pin in my leg that was a real pain in the backside. And I mean literally, because every time you yes. sat down, you sat down on a yeah. steel pin. Yeah. Um, f physically, I was in good nick. You know, I was... Um, I had loads and loads of stamina, and I was back up to normal sort of strength. I couldn't push the bike very well. But um, there was no psychological problem. So you were in good shape. You oh, got, yeah. You got a good bike, and Assen is a rider's course. Oh, yeah, I loved Assen, because I thought if the thing uh, lacks any power anywhere, I know I can ride good round Assen. And um, I set off in the race. Uh, who were you up against? Agostini. Yes. Um, uh, Agostini on the factory Yamaha. Yeah. Uh, I think Reedy was there on the MV, Bonera. Yes. Um, and in your mind, had you got the best bike? Uh, no, I didn't exactly have the best bike. It probably had the most horsepower, but um, it didn't exactly have the best spread of power. But handling-wise, the thing was like night and day compared to the previous year. So in the light of the circumstances, the bike, yourself, the circuit, what was the game plan? Well, I was just going to hope that I got a good start. And I can't even remember what kind of start I got, but uh, I know I was sort of... Up with, uh, up with Ago on halfway around the first lap, and I was going past the every time every lap when I went past the pits. You know the the mechanics would be jumping up and down and mm. leaping up and mm. down. You know because I don't know, they sort of sensed that uh, this was going to be the one. How, how far behind were you when the race started? I mean, did you get away well? Oh, yeah, I can't. I really can't remember, Murray. You know, I can uh, the yeah, sort of beginning of the race. Together. Yeah, it's sort of, yeah. sort of a blur. And uh, I can remember following Ago around, and Ago obviously knew Assen really well, but I knew it just as well as he did. And I sort of had about four or five places where I could pass him. And uh, he, he knew the places that I would pass him and that. So I thought, well, he, you know, he's a really clever guy. I'm going to lull him into a full sense of security. I kept going on the same side each time, each time, each time. Uh, I was. There was a, in Assen in those days, there was a fast right-hander onto the mm -hmm. front straight, and I was much quicker than Ago through this right-hander. So I thought to make it really sort of spectacular, really to rub it in, you know, I could have passed him at the beginning of the last lap down at the hairpin, and uh, I just sat behind him the whole, whole race, and as I went past the last lap, you know, last lap boards hanging out, my dad's going. <laughs> I could see all this, though, because Ago was right there and I wasn't interested in what he was doing. And I could see the mechanics going, go, 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 you know. And um, the la last night I went uh, through the corner at the back of the pits and Ago was still in front. I was, you know, I was just following him and that. And I can imagine what they all felt when I came. So there were two two-strokes yes. ahead, the Suzuki yeah. with you on yeah. it and the Yamaha with Agostino yeah. on it. But Phil Reed on the four-stroke MV wasn't so far behind, was he? No, ah, oh, we dropped dropped him off. Yeah. Um, I think the the MV really getting a bit tired. Yeah, though, getting yeah. a bit long in the tooth, yeah. and it was uh, a bit sort of uh, hard to ride. Now, in knowing what a showman you are, I suspect that you could have actually won comparatively easily if you'd wanted to. Fair comment? Oh that? yeah, I can, I'm sure I could have done a runner halfway through the race, but. Uh, I was, it, it was something that I really wanted to savour, you know, because I knew I had the thing in the bag. And uh, as I, I, when I was coming through the last series of corners before you come back into view at the start and finish line, I thought they are going to freak when I'm still behind Ego, you know, because uh, obviously they're willing me to win, but they wouldn't have known that I could, could win. So when I, I came into view on the last lap and I was about, oh, I don't know, probably five or six feet behind 
and uh, then down down a little straight bit and into this fast right hand and I eased up a bit going into the fast right hand I really got a run on it and Ago was expecting me to come past him this side because that's where you'd been showing yeah because that's where I'd show myself every lap so he went like this and I just I went down the other side and you won by how much oh I don't know I won by about that much I think maybe yeah maybe that much fastest lap just over 98 miles an hour, yeah. which was very quick. Oh, yeah, it was quick. It knocked about, oh, I think, about six seconds off the lap record or something. Incredible. Right? Now, why have you chosen that? Out of all the races that you've ridden in, why have you chosen that as number one? Well, because it meant to me, it meant so much to me. I had uh, always wanted to do good in the 500 class. I'd won 750 Grand Prix and that. I'd won 50cc Grand Prix, I'd won a 125cc Grand Prix. And I always, the 500 class was the blue ribbon thing. I wanted to be 500 world champion. And uh, well, I knew when I got the bike sorted out at the beginning of 75, um, that was going to be the year. You know, there was no doubt in my mind that I wasn't going to be world champion. And this was, in fact, your very first 500cc win. It was, that was it. So you must have felt as high as a mountain when the Oh, race. yeah, it was great. Wonderful. You know, what sort of reception from the crowd? Oh, they went, went bananas because I, I don't know, I was popular in Holland and, uh, and there was always a lot of uh, English people that went over to the races, <coughs> to the Dutch Grand Prix, and they just went bananas. Barry, we're going to move on nine years now from the 1975 Dutch TT to your second choice, which is the 1984 South African Grand Prix. It's your 17th year of racing. Mm. It's your last year of Grand Prix racing. You're back with Suzuki. Now, what was your mental attitude for that race? Well, the thing was that uh, during during practice, there'd been speed track times and that, and the my bike was about 18 to 20 kilometers slower than the factory Yamaha's through the speed trap. Um, but my bike handled fantastically well. It, was, it had a Harris frame that the guys built for me. And it was, it, I really, the bike was great. I loved it, the way, everything about it, the way it handled. And that, it just didn't have the horsepower. And when, when it started to pour with rain, when I got, I can remember getting out of bed in the morning, uh, and opening the curtains and saying, it's different, it's pouring with rain, I don't believe it. I thought, well, it can't last, there's no chance. And you were happy? Oh, sure I was happy, because if I had a bite that wasn't quick enough, I knew that whatever, it, uh, whatever the deficit was, I could make it up in the rain. And, uh, oh, fantastic. So I went to, went to the racetrack and, and then the rain stopped. Oh, bloody hell, it's just my luck. So... I think we had a <coughs> sort of a practice and I'm, I put um, some intermediate tyres on and that and it was virtually slick weather so there I am sitting on the line ready to, ready to start the race. Uh, I qualify, I don't know where I qualify, somewhere, somewhere, yeah that's pretty obvious isn't it? Um, I did some, somewhere in the first six I think or seventh and uh, I'm sitting on the line with slicks and that and then we go off on the warming up now and it starts to rain. I thought, this is... Uh, in the meantime, I'd been onto the airport and uh, I'd spoke to the military airfield up the road and the, the way the wind was blowing and that, and they said, yeah, there's, there's rain, it's whatever, and, and the wind's 240 at 20 knots and all this kind of stuff. I thought, great, this, you know... I said to the organiser, listen, it's going to piddle down with rain. You're going to start this race, it's going to piss down. You know, why don't we wait for it to rain? Um, so we go off in this warming up lap and then it just buckets down. Now you were up against, amongst others, Eddie Lawson, who we certainly did not regard as being good in the wet because we all knew, didn't we, that Californians couldn't ride in the wet because it was always sunny in California. Did you in any way regard yourself as being in the twilight of your career? Uh, I, well, I knew that I was sort of... I, whatever happened, I always planned to retire at the end of 85, but I didn't know that 1984 was going to be my last year. So what happened in the race? Talk us through it. Well, the, 
I was never very good at starting bikes, all that bloody push start. I mean, yeah, you, you yeah. struggle your nuts off for yeah. three days or two days yeah. qualifying, you know, going out and get a little better, a little better. And then you sit on the line and you push the thing and it doesn't start. You've wasted two days, you know, you might just well sat in the motor down for two days. Which is exactly what happened. You got away on three cylinders. Right? Yeah, I pushed the thing and it started and it just started on one cylinder. And then it sort of popped and banged on another cylinder. I thought, oh, blood. The first thing I did, as I jumped in the seat, and it, it was on one and then on two, and in and out on, on two, I thought, I've come all this bloody way for this. I don't believe it. All this, that was the first thing. Yes. I thought, all this aggravation yes. for this, I yes. really... So I thought, oh, it's not worth it. So I just stuck it up against the stop, and the rev counter was around at 11,000, 13,000, or whatever it was. Try and make this thing clear anyway. It didn't clear. I rode all the way around on the first lap. And as I went down, got down towards the bottom corner on the second lap, it started to pop and bang on one of the other cylinders. So I thought, oh, well, this is... How far down the field were you, oh, I was, Almost last. I was last. That was it. I was... Uh, I, I, I did that next lap, and as, as I got to the top of the hill, it started to bang on all four cylinders. And as I came out, out uh -huh. of the corner at the top, it chimed in on four cylinders. And as I went over the line to start my third lap, I was 46 seconds behind Lawson. So they didn't, I didn't know that, but they, <laughs> they, they thought we better not show him the board, otherwise, you know, it'd be a waste of time. Well, who would have believed this from Boot Van Dolmen? That's no surprise. But Eddie Lawson, a Californian who doesn't go well in the rain, he's really fired up and ready to go. And Sheeny really trying. You can see that Suzuki just twitching. They come over the brow of the hill, and Barry Sheen overtakes Franco and Sheeny. Barry Sheen now is in fourth position. Fifth position, my apologies, behind Ron Aslam, who is fourth. So Barry Sheen, fifth now. And he's well into his stride. Look at him, riding superbly. I mean, nobody is leaning the bike over further than that in these conditions. Well, remember, of course, that Barry Sheen came, was just a fraction away from death at the British Grand Prix at Silverstone when he, he uh, hit another machine that was lying in the track at uh, the British Grand Prix in 1982. He bounced back to health in a remarkable fashion, made his comeback here at Kyle Army just 12 months ago and honestly he's riding as well as ever today that is the race leader behind him is number nine ron haslam then comes raymond roche and didier de radiz four nine eleven and seventeen that's the race order ignore number 25 that's brett Steele. he's a lap down and yellow flags were out whether that was haslam Somebody went down there, but we need a wider shot to find out who it was. Well, the yellow flags have been being waved. And it's Haslam. It is. Haslam's out of the race. The bike too badly damaged to continue. Well, that's bad luck indeed for Ron Haslam. Lying second, and we're going to see the moment. Whoa, there he goes. The bike end over, and Ron Haslam on his feet. Well, bad luck indeed for Ron so that was it. I just set off, and uh, I hated the big fat 16-inch rear tyre. The thing was aquaplaning all over the show, and I, I don't like the rain, but I was always good in the wet, and it just didn't give me any proper feel or anything. Then I could see a whole. As I was going down the hill, I could see some, see a red bike going back in the opposite direction. Oh, yeah, on. really. Yeah. You know. So um, then I got. Uh, uh, science said EL EL1 minus 28 or something. So it was Eddie Lawson leading. The red bike being Eddie Lawson yeah, yeah. on his Yamaha. Yeah. yeah, Eddie Lawson leading. I was 28 seconds behind. Yeah. So, so oh, well, I, who cares about Lawson? I just want to catch, you know, whoever's in front of me. So I kept ploughing on and ploughing on. I was catching this lot up at a rapid rate of knots, you know, and then it got uh, EL minus, I don't know. 21, I thought, well, I'll keep at it, you know, so I kept pressing on, and um, then I could see Didier, Didier de Radigas, mm -hmm. yeah, right in the distance, so Didier's really good in the rain, so I pressed on and pressed on and pressed on, and I got to within about, 
I don't know, I suppose a second and a half I did here. And um, it was quite cool, it was quite a cool day. And my knees were aching. Mm. Mm. And when, you, when I ride in the rain, or indeed all the time I was racing, I used to ride my toes on the footrest. Mm -hmm. And as I came, I came around a right-hander before that left, tight left, at the back of the pits mm -hmm. there. And as I came around there, my foot slipped off the footrest. And as it slipped off the footrest, I thought, oh, bloody hell, I was trying to get my foot back on the footrest. And I was taking more notice of getting my foot back on the footrest, so I thought, oh, I'll just go straight a little bit and run wide. So I ran wide. And all my hard work I'd done for the, yeah. the last six yeah. laps had just gone yeah. right Where down. are you in the race by now? I was uh, fourth. Right, so the man that you have to try to catch is Raymond Roche, the Frenchman yeah. who was on a Honda. How yeah. far behind him were you? I didn't know. I hadn't got the faintest didn't idea. I, he was there. Oh, I didn't even know he was there. And um, I thought, I've got to get Didier. So I called Didier and I got past got past him okay and I thought right well that's all right I can stay in front of Diddy I didn't know I knew that I was in third place and uh, at the beginning of the last lap they just said you know, my ball was LL the last lap and I was something like uh, like uh, seven seconds behind um, Rosh but I didn't know that and so I come rushing around and, uh, and we get to the last corner um, the last right-hand corner, and Raymond Rush is there. Yeah. And I thought, oh, poor Rush, you know, he must have had some sort of trouble and retired his couple of laps behind us. I didn't know it was Rush in second place. And I could, have, I could have dived on the inside without any problem whatsoever. And I thought, well, it's stupid last lap, you know, the poor bloke, you know, don't want to, oh, you know, what's yeah. he up to? Yeah. And as I went into the corner, the stand was here, and all the people in the stand stood up. Perfect. I thought, oh shit, it's yeah. Rosh, he's yeah. second place. Yeah. And as as they stood up, Rosh turned around and he saw yeah. me. Yeah. And that was it, he just gassed it and the Honda was just... And he beat you about three tenths of a second. Yeah, the, the, Honda, well, the Honda just had the horsepower. And uh, as you had done in Holland nine years before, you made the fastest lap. Mm. And it was, again, at a speed of about 90 miles an hour. Rodriguez now, and this is the battle for third place. And either Didier de Rodriguez has gone to sleep, or Barry Sheen has suddenly got his second wind because we've got a race on our hands again. The next time round, it'll be three laps to go. And Sheen right in de Rodriguez's slipstream there, and the bike's just twisting. You remember we saw Sheen make that mistake, nearly come to grief, and they've got three laps left to sort out this battle. Didier and Barry going at it, hammer and tongs, the Belgian boy on bike number 17, ahead of the former 500cc world champion from Britain, Barry Sheen, battling away for third spot. I think you were right, Chris, in suggesting that Barry was just sort of waiting to the end of the race. He will now surely pick his moment to pass to Rediges, but not too soon, not to show just how, not to show the young Belgian just how fast he can go. And Sheen again, just shadow boxing as it were right at the back of the Redeeds poised to make his moment when he's ready to looking for the gap looking for the mistake or possibly looking for the section of the circuit that he feels that he is quicker than the Belgian and of course a, a something in the back of Barry's mind will be telling him that de Radiguez, being a youngster might be inclined to overstep the mark and uh, Barry doesn't want to pass him too early and have uh, Didier make some sort of mistake that could possibly bring them both down. Well, that's a consideration that uh, Sheen has already worked out, I'm sure, of any wily campaigner. And what a remarkable start to the game. And Sheen goes to the inside line. There was the moment he was waiting for. And it was almost as if Barry knew exactly what he was going to do. And do it he did, if I may say so. And Sheen did. then, out ahead of the Nadeeds into third place. Two laps to go for the leaders. And Sheen, you can see the bike twitching. Nadeeds won't take this line down. Nadeeds did well here at Kyle Army last year in the 250 race. Two laps to go then in the scrap for third spot as the leaders catch up again on the Greek Papandro. And Sheen trying to get away from Daradigas to make a clean break of it. He's put a few yards in front of him already as he dives past the Greek into the tricky downhill barbecue bend. And he 
he's put about 10 bikes lengths between him and Deradiguez. Sweeping up through Yuxke now at about 120 miles an hour on the run into sunset. Well, Deradiguez won't have given up the scrap and as Sheen passes uh, Klaus Klein, laps him, Deradiguez has to go the wide way round, bend the bike over just a little bit more. I think we're just possibly asking a little too much for Sheen to catch Roche in the closing stages. Not really a possibility. Sheen through the S's, Didier still there. And Didier, I'm sure, will be very disappointed if he doesn't make the top three. He's ridden so well. Sheen throws off another tear off Pfizer. Trying to clear his vision for this final lap and a half. Sheen riding brilliantly. Van Dolman moves over to let him pass. And Van Dolman pulls in behind Sheen, because I'm sure he's not really sure whether, whether Didier de Radix is in the hunt. There's Eddie Lawson, though, the race leader. He's on his last lap. Just one more circuit round the Kyle Army track, and Eddie Lawson will have picked up 15 points in the opening round of the World Championship. And I can, cannot emphasise emphatically enough how few people here other than perhaps Eddie Lawson himself who believed that this man would not be winning this race when conditions were as bad as they were when it started and as bad as they have been throughout the race a remarkable ride from the Californian he started the season well in Daytona he finished fourth but that was after stopping to change the rear tyre twice and uh, that was a magnificent performance in view of that stoppage and Lawson who didn't look that good in practice has either found something special when it comes to race day or perhaps was fooling us all Lawson then through the S's for the very last time Lawson can afford to take it easy now He's well clear of Raymond Roche. Just the last bit. And Lawson isn't taking it easy. I withdraw my words. The bike again weaving its way through. The front wheel wagging. He's going over the line now. The checkered flag goes out. And Eddie Lawson has won. And, uh, and what have I said? Sheen can't catch Roche. What am I talking about? He's almost there. Raymond Roche almost caught napping, but Roche finishes second. And what a tremendous ride from Barry Sheen, who almost had another lap, and it could well have been a different story. But you were happy with South Africa. Well, yeah, I, I would say that uh, in 1984, I rode better in 84 than I, than I did in my whole racing career. Right, we're going back uh, seven years now to the early stages of 1977, the Italian Grand Prix at Imola. You are still with Suzuki. What did you think of the Imola circuit? I liked Imola. I, re I really thought it was uh, a really good circuit because there were a lot of fast corners on it and um, a nice couple of hairpins. Dangerous because they've put some chicanes in now that weren't yeah, there. I, then. I know. That's what I was just going to say I hate it now. I did, the last years I raced there, I mean, they completely destroyed Imola, you know, where you come down into Aqua Minerale, yes. the double run. Yes. It was a sensational circuit, because there was the corner... Opposition. Um, Agostini and Baker, really, they were the ones that uh, um, should, should have gone really good there. Um, I was really surprised that, uh, that it ended up being Ferrari into a wreck. 14th at the end of the first lap. So once again, you had to get your head behind the bubble and, 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 and press on. Right? Well, the thing was, you see, then uh, Imola was about, what, 38 lap race or something. I mean, it was a bloody long race. It was hard work, Imola. And I thought, well, OK, I didn't get a very good start. I didn't go really hard at it to start with. I just wanted to get the tyres warm and all that kind of stuff. And I always found that a lot of the guys go really quickly at the beginning and then slow, slow up. So I always used to figure it was nice and easy to come from behind, just peg them back little by little by little. 
So, all right, you're 14th at the end of the first lap. And I finally got away from Baker. Um, it left me with uh, Taraka and Ferrari. And they were completely psyched out because I just followed them. And, and they knew you were there? And I, yeah, and every time they... Uh, I, Every time that they knew that, <laughs> that uh, I knew that they look look round coming out out of this hairpin to see where I was, and every time they looked round, I was sitting bolt upright. So they thought, well, he's just waiting, and I was. It was hard. Do you, do you ever actually eyeball them, look 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 at them through the visor, or you you can't do that? Mm, oh yeah, sometimes when you go down the big long straight, you know, you'd look down like that. And you can tell the real serious ones they're flat out. Like they, they don't look round. So you got past. The two of them where? Ah, uh, I think at the end of uh, the end of the uh, start and finish straight, going into the hairpin. But the, the nice thing about winning that race at Imola was the fact. Barry, we're halfway through your top six. Tell me, how have you chosen them in your mind? The, your six greatest races. It took me quite a long time to come up with them, actually, because I was... Uh, I thought of this race and that race, and then I, then, uh, I thought, yeah, that's definitely, definitely it. And then I thought again, and I thought of a lot of reasons why there were other races that were better. But it was, it was difficult, a really difficult well, kind. Maybe significantly, we're, we're back in Holland again, and this time it's uh, 1976. Mm. Your number one choice was the 75 Dutch mm. TT, not Grand Prix, and your number four choice is the 76 Dutch TT. Uh, oh, like 30 degrees hot. Yeah, really terrible. How did that affect you? Well, that was the, the, one of the reasons why I chose it as one of my top six is because I always prided myself on being fit, and fitness, uh, when it's a hot race and you ask any of the F1 drivers or any of the bike riders, you really do have to be fit when it's hot. You know, it drains you physically, mentally, and prior to the race, they wanted the race cut short and all this kind of stuff. One of the sidecar uh, drivers actually died and they revived him. Um, and it was, I knew it was going to be a really very, very difficult race. You arrived there having won three out of three races you'd ridden in that year. You'd won in mm. France and you'd won in Austria and you had won in Italy and therefore, of course... I never did. I didn't hit it off with reading. Right. Now, you, you were on the Suzuki again. Lucinelli? Suzuki. And Phil Reed? Suzuki. So, three Suzuki, two strokes. This, this is getting to be a, a bit of a broken record. But for the fourth time, you get away badly. Mm. Twenty second. <laughs> was it that bad? <laughs> yes. I yeah. I, well, I used to. I always used to try my best. And the main thing was that, with my legs the way they were, I still had the pin in my leg, that fourteen inch thing. And if once I committed myself to leaping on the bike, if it wasn't going, it was such a pain mm. in the backside. Mm literally and very difficult and more to the point very slow for me to get off the bike again and push it you know so what i used to do i used to give it a good long push before i dropped the clutch because if if i dropped the clutch banged it and it fired and jumped in the seat really quickly and it wasn't going that was it you know for me to get it back off it and start it again would have been they'd have done half a lap by then. now this isn't meant to be a daft question but was the fact that you repeatedly got a, a bad start, a blessing in disguise, because it gave you an enormous stimulus, or would you have preferred mm. to have got away well anyway? One, two, three right-handers. And if you really um, were brave and sort of got it right, you could get through all three flat out. And if you got through all th three flat out, there was then a left-hand kink that was flat out. If you got in the right position. But if you mucked up the second one, 
you arrived at the third one in a right old state <laughs> and you didn't get through the, the left hand one after that. Now, I've, we've talked about uh, Luke and Ellie, we've talked about Phil Reed. Uh, what we haven't done is talk yet about your main opposition mm. in the race, and that was Giacomo Agostini. Mm. Well, Ago, I, uh, I, as far as I was concerned, I knew I, knew I could beat him. And uh, I knew that probably the, the thing that was going to buckle people was going to be the heat. There was no two ways about that. And I knew I was uh, fitter than any of the other lot. And I knew Agostini was fit as well. But after all the fighting and arguing and stuff, uh, he came out right. You got the right deal. Oh, yes. Now, Barry, you didn't win the 1982 Dutch TT, but visually it certainly has to be a truly fantastic race. And let's look at the lineup. Uh, there was Franco Uncini, who subsequently mm. went on to be world champion. Uh, Cork Ballington, mm. riding uh, a 500 Kawasaki. Kenny Roberts, yourself. Uh, Jack Middleberg and Freddie Spencer. And for most of the race, four of you were virtually tied together. Now, just tell us first of all about the beginning of the race. Oh, the beginning of the race, it was... Uh, we all got much of a muchness as a start. Um, and we were just swapping, swapping positions. Um, I thought, okay, right, Assen, it was on the, the, the long, old circuit at Assen. And it's a long race, 15 laps, whatever. And uh, I was in sort of fourth place, third place, yeah. fourth place. Yeah. Because the, always the best thing to do at Assen, um, it's very hard on tyres. So if you really tear the things to pieces at the beginning of the race when you really need the grip at the end when it is hard work because it's physically tiring that's it. Franco Ancini was in the lead and, and looking looking good with Jack Middleberg performing in front of his mm. home crowd, uh, crowd Kenny Roberts and yourself and then as you say in a situation where you were on slick tyres mm. with no tread grip only for a dry circuit it starts gently to rain yeah bad bad enough Oh, really? Because the thing was that um, none of us knew it was raining. And we get had come howling through this fast series of corners. And uh, there's three rights, and then there's a bit of a straight, and there's a fast left-hand kink. As I was going for, towards this kink, I thought, I'm sure the circuit looks shiny down there. And it was very overcast, mm. you know, it really looked black and that. Nothing on your visor? No, nothing at all. And then as I got into the beginning of this left-hand kink. I thought, Christ, it's soaking wet. You know, then you've got to stop for a hairpin. And you've got the other three in front of you? Yeah, yeah. other three in front. But they were having the same trouble as yeah. me. I knew that if I couldn't stop, they couldn't yeah. stop. And uh, it was really frightening. Now, it, it, it never ceases to amaze me that they continue to run that race because it started to rain gently, but then it got worse and worse and worse till there were almost rooster tails of water coming up from mm. the rear wheels. It must have been diabolical. Oh, it was ridiculous, totally ridiculous, because when um, it started to rain in one part of the circuit, then another part, and then it, the heavens opened up. And it really, it was, once it started to rain everywhere, it was impossible. Now, in those circumstances, when you are in fourth position, what's going through your mind? Do you think, uh, I'm going to settle for fourth and stay alive, or I'm going to be brave and see if I can blow the others off? No, just self-preservation. You know, as far as I was concerned, I was riding around thinking, what a bunch of twats, why don't they stop the race? Mm -hmm. And K Kenny Roberts looked to me as though he was riding slightly o over his head because once he overshot a corner. Mm. Yeah, what he did, he, um, I was right behind him when he did it, he went to go on the outside of Middleburg mm. around a hairpin. I mean, it's yeah, you nip up the inside mm. of the hairpin, but up the outside, and he shot on the outside of Jack, Middleburg on the brakes, and naturally enough, Jack, the last place in the world that anybody's going to come past you is down the outside going into a hairpin, and Jack was moving across, and God, Kenny banged Jack up. And but, then and then Kenny Roberts got it really wrong. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because it was after these fast three right-handers, and uh, I thought, oh, boy, look, there's surface water down there, you know, mm. no way. And I eased off, and... Uh, I was going the same speed as Jack and Franco, 
And then all of a sudden, Roberts came past. I thought, whoa, get ready to avoid the bits. There ain't no way he's going to get around there. And um, sure enough, he, you know, he came past me really quickly, like that. And I eased up even more. Was that, I, was that foolhardy, in your opinion? Well, you know, everybody makes mistakes, and that was a radical one. I'll never forget, Barry. He was walking away from the bike, uh, and you, he looked over his shoulder casually, and he suddenly realised that the bike was on fire mm. and ran back to it. Oh, yeah. He, well, he realised it was on fire because you're not allowed to use another bike. Um, once, once you start on a bike, you have to use that bike for the race. So it caught fire and he picked the bike up and pulled it away and it was still on fire and it burnt all the car and everything. Yeah. And uh, they put that bike in the van and used another bike anyway. And then, and nobody and then, ever knew. Uh, and then Graham, oh really? Oh, a bit of uh, American gamesmanship, was it? Well, yeah. Very or small. Japanese. And, oh, I, I don't know. But, <laughs> but um, yeah, they definitely used another bike. Well, what a diplomat you are, Barry Sheen. And then uh, Graham Crosby got it all Yeah, Crosby. Yeah. The whole point about it was it was sheer luck. You know, when you're riding on riding on slicks, uh, even when I ease right up, you know, you'd be going along and you go through, past the start and finish, you go through a very, very fast left-hand kink. And you do so 160 odd mile an hour and the thing would be going like this. And you've got no steering at all. I mean, you could, if you had the balls to do it, you could turn the handlebars yeah. like that and nothing yeah. would happen. Yeah. You know, I, I knew once the cross flags were out, they'd take it from, the, you know, the results at the end previous lap and I didn't really care you know I thought bugger this lot I'm not gonna fall off in this so another one for the memory book yeah really it was it was there was a restart after that and I just led it was leading it by five seconds and uh, I got it got it wrong in that uh, I run over a damp patch and it got totally sideways it broke all the fairing brackets and uh, the screen everything and that was the end of the story then I just Slow. I lost five seconds a lap, and uh, I ended up finishing third. And the rest of '82, in a nutshell. In a nutshell, in a hospital bed, really. <laughs>
But I just hope that the thing doesn't, you know, collapse during the race. Or, you know, not collapse, but leak. So, sitting on the line, we get a good start. Good, did you hear that? Good yes. start, yeah. Thanks. Very first, proud of that. First one yeah. we had so far. <laughs> yeah, I got, got a pretty good start. And uh, Hartog was away like a rat up a drain pipe. And, uh, and Kenny got good star. Now Ferrari was up there too. Oh, Ferrari was up there, right. Yeah. And from Woodcote, and look at Barry Sheen doing an absolutely monumental wheelie as the front wheel reared right up and they go down to tops, lap one. It's Hartog, it's Will Hartog, the lightning starter. Will Hartog in the white leathers, the Dutch grass farmer. On a Suzuki, and behind him is Ferrari, and behind Ferrari is Barry Sheen in third position, and Sheen going up into second place. What a magnificent start. I think both, both Kenny and I knew that the only people to worry about were each other. So we, we ended up sort of being together, and then we just, he'd have a real good go to get rid of me, and took, couldn't do it. So then I'd have a real good go to get rid of him and I couldn't do it. So we knew that it would come down to the last few laps. Can, can I take, interrupt mm. you and take you back a bit? Because for the first 10 laps, it was one, one of these great Silverstone mm. races, and there were a lot of them. Yeah, yeah. You could practically have thrown a blanket over Hartog, Ferrari, Roberts, and yourself. Look at the symmetry of these riders as they bank to left and right and they go down hanger straight now at 160 miles an hour. Roberts takes it. Roberts uses his superior power and blasts past into the lead. Kenny Roberts then, the world champion who has already won four events this year, is the new leader on lap five out of 28 in the Marlborough British Grand Prix. Katayama, Takazumi Katayama is in the pits and that's the second of the two Hondas. Vic Grant out on the very first lap. Katayama and Sheen challenging Hartog for second place as they come down to Woodcote at the end of lap five. And Hartog's going to retake the lead. And he does so and a great roar goes up from the crowd. This Dutchman is tremendously popular with the British crowd, this gigantic British crowd. And we're seeing a British Grand Prix, the like of which we haven't seen for a very long time. Because just behind these three are Virginio Ferrari, second place in the World Championship. Roberts looks over his shoulder. There's Ferrari. And behind Ferrari, who is fourth, it's Van Dolman. And Hartog leads. Hartog leads. Sheen is in second place. And Kenny Roberts is in third. And you could put a stopwatch on them, and I've just done so. And the gap between first and third is 0.52 seconds, or it was then. Chapel, hang a straight. This is where Roberts took the lead on the previous lap. The leader. And the second place. She leads. Barry Sheen goes through. Marvellous bit of overtaking. Just slid through on the inside of Hartog. And look at the wobble on that bike. Barry Sheen was not at all happy with the handling of his machine in the first three sessions of practice. So for the last session, they took a drastic step, changed the front forks to air springing, and Hartog goes through. A tremendous ding-dong battle between three of the top riders today, Hartog, Sheen, and Roberts, for mastery and the 15 points in the World Championship. Each of them implicitly at... Hartog, who comes from Aberkeck in Holland, a grass farmer. There's Roberts going through. Just for how long? Now, Roberts in second place. But there is a fantastic cat and mouse game going on between these three. Neither willingly giving an inch to the other each trusting the other two. See Chicotto. Then behind Chicotto. And Roberts leads into Woodcock. Now, as the roar goes up from the crowd, who are seeing some magnificent motorcycle racing, it's very, very seldom that you see as close a scrap as this for the lead 
Barry Sheen comes out of Robert Slipstream. You notice the way that they are studiously avoiding that patch of concrete dust on the corner and cops because they know that underneath it is oil. And watch too, Virginio Ferrari, number 11, in fourth place, because although he's about uh, two seconds behind Barry Sheen, who is third, he's not dropping back at all. Roberts, now, Roberts has got the first opportunity to break because he's coming into the hangar straight in first position with a clear road in front of him, and this is where he will really wind on the power to try and break the toe between himself, Hartog, who is second, Sheen, who is third, and clear off. Hartog in the white levels, Eddie Roberts in the yellow outfit, and the gap between... Kenny Roberts, Ferrari through in fourth place. Sheen up into second position out of Hartog slipstream. Ben Dolman is still fifth. And then, although it's of academic interest, and Sheen riding up onto the curving there. How did you and Kenny make the break? Did they did they get tired or? I uh, no, I, the thing was, if you look at the lap times and that, we were just pacing, you know, because it was a 28 or 30 lap race or whatever it was. And I don't, I'm pretty sure we weren't in a hurry to get rid of him. The thing that, the thing that, uh, that Silverstone really illustrated to, to anybody, you know, I'd been saying the bloody Yamaha's so fast on top speed, and the motorcycle news especially would be saying, oh, Barry Sheen's moaning about the Yamaha being fast, total load of rubbish, you know, it's just Roberts is so brilliant mm. that, uh, mm. I mean, any bugger can ride a bike in a straight line. And I think would just, We'd be going down the back straight and he'd just go and clear off, you know, absolutely disappear. Well, not disappear, you know, but all the hard work you've done everywhere right. else, yeah. you know, you, yeah. and coming up out of Abbey, I'd be quick through Abbey Curve, then we'd get out of Abbey Curve and he'd just pull away. I but remember it, doing mine up for lap after lap mm -hmm. because you would come down the hangar straight into Stowe, and by the time you got to Stowe, you were together. And I can remember at least once being enormously impressed because you actually turn and looked across at him. How can you do that at that speed, knowing that a corner's coming up? Well, it, it's all right. If you're racing with somebody, you know, I really used to enjoy racing with Kenny. And uh, it just doesn't bother you. You know, it's just something he was waving or shaking his arms and that. That's... And you're not, you're not losing performance uh, in so doing? No, no, no. I, one time I came out of the corner after the start and finish. And um, I stuck my fingers up there. And, and Murray Walker said, said, Oh, look, oh, look he's waving. <laughs> <laughs> Murray Sheen's waving at Kenny Roberts. <laughs> Down to Woodcote again to complete the 15th lap. And now Sheen doing it. It could well be the Barry Sheen, yes, at the end of the lap. And the crowd rises, the crowd roars. And Barry Sheen leads at the end of lap 15. Down to Cops. Will Hartog dropping back all the time. So the Dutchman is either tired himself, and it's quite a... And look at that! Barry Sheen, with absolute effrontery, not only looks over his shoulder, but takes his left clutch hand off the handlebar and waves to Kenny Roberts. And cares Kenny Roberts' answer. Don't you wave at me, young man, because this is what will happen to you. <laughs> so it was, that was all a bit of a game. You know, he was waving at me, I was waving at him. So, but we knew that it was going to come down to the last two laps. There was no two ways about it. And we were just, I was waiting any moment for him to go. Mm. And it might have been four laps before the end. It might have been three. It might have been the last lap or whatever. And he was waiting any moment for me to, to go. So I thought, right. So three laps before the end, he, he went. That was it. He, he, he turned it on. He was going. You know, that was his effort for the race. So it was going, going great. I mean, it was perfect. I had... I knew exactly where I was going to nail him. There was, it was going to be a woodcut last mm -hmm. lap, no mm -hmm. doubt whatsoever. Did he know? No, right. because I passed him once going into woodcut on the inside, and I thought, okay, I won't pass him anymore there because otherwise he'll know where I'm going to do it. And I knew that I was quicker through woodcut than Kenny was. So we go on, and it comes to I think it was two laps before the end. It was a yeah, it must have been two laps before the end because it was a lap after Kenny made his effort you know you could I could always tell when Kenny was really doing it and he could always tell when I was really doing it and uh, we came up out of Abbey Curve and 
I was just right. I was about, what, I don't know, 50 foot behind him or whatever. And there was a bunch of back markers. And Kenny went on the inside of George Fogarty. And as he went on the inside, George Fogarty went like that. And I was, I was committed to be on the outside. I couldn't think, oh, shit, I'm going to go on the inside. Yeah. It was too late. I was, he picked it up, and I was on the outside of him. And he was drifting out, and I couldn't go any faster, otherwise it would have taken me right out of the circuit. And I thought, that has just wrecked my British Grand Prix. And I thought, well, no, I don't know. You know, I was, there was no way. actually went into Woodcote about 15 metres behind Kenny Roberts yeah. at the start of the last lap. Yeah. So it was all down to the last lap. Oh, yeah, it was, you know, as far as I was concerned, it was the last, it was the, the last lap. You see, what happened prior, prior to getting balls, I was, sort of 50 feet behind when I came out of when I came out of uh, Woodcote to start my last lap I was 150 yards behind you know so, oh, I just put everything I could into into that last lap I break really really late wasn't he wasn't he too oh yeah but you know I was you've got more than here well you? I don't know about that but I was going quicker than he was for sure the last lap and uh, well, I must have been otherwise I wouldn't have caught yeah, up 150 right. yards so I made a bit of ground going into Stowe, is it? Yeah, Stowe. Yes. And then club. club made a bit of ground. And then I thought, OK, right. I knew I was good through Abbey Curve, quick through Abbey Curve. So I thought, well, if I really go at it, then I may get a run up the hill. And I really went at it, and I didn't, just didn't really get any run kind of run at all. So when we approached Woodcut, I just thought, oh, right. I left my break in really late, but the mo not too late and the main thing was I got the power on like as early as I could get it on and I thought I'd get a good run on him and I got a run and I got a run but it just was that much too it short. It was uh, half a length yeah. at the end of the race. But the trouble was you see also I was I was if the line had been another yard further on it would have been all right but I had the run but I just didn't have the the, the distance to do it. They're coming up to Woodcote at the end of lap 27 to start lap 28 and with that tail ender in front of Barry Sheen now Kenny Roberts goes through 0.69 69 hundredths of a second ahead of Sheen and that could well have decided the race in favour of Kenny Roberts because Barry Sheen is just far enough behind Roberts I think Roberts even stands on the rest a little to look back there but again, he's got two tail enders in front of him, and Barry Sheen is indiscernibly gaining. Roberts. Into Beckett's. Sheen behind him. Roberts goes through on the inside of the tail ender, and the tail ender looks to me very much like Gianni Rolando, the Italian rider. Roberts is past him. Sheen is past him. Down the hangar straight for the last time the 28th time in this 28 lap race into Stowe Corner for the last time at 100 miles an hour it's going to be one of the closest Grand Prix finishes for a very very long time Sheen is far enough ahead of Will Hartog not to have to worry about the Dutchman as they go to Club Corner the last but one right hander on the circuit because they're coming up to Abbey and is, is Barry Sheen going to be able to do anything about it I doubt it but Kenny Roberts goes into Abbey. It's that close, you can hardly divide them on the stopwatch. From Abbey up to Woodcote, underneath the breed is going to be tremendously close as they go into the last corner of the race. This is it at 130 miles an hour. The chicken flag is out. Kenny Roberts and Barry Sheen is gaining, gaining, gaining. And there is less than a machine's length in it with a fantastic race with Will Hartog finishing in third place. And Kenny Roberts won the 1979 Marlborough British Grand Prix at record speed, undoubtedly having shattered the lap record. Barry Sheen has every reason to feel absolutely delighted. At the end of that magnificent race, the gap between Kenny Roberts and Barry Sheen was three one hundredths of a second. Well, your number six was by number one, but they were all fantastic mm -hmm. races, and it's been fabulous talking to you. <laughs> okay, thanks, Murray.